Yeah, all right. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just welcome your presence here tonight, Father. Oh, I pray you'll be honored because we're going to talk about you, Lord. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about your greatness tonight. And so, Father, I just uh, pray that our words will uh, be sweet to your ears. I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds and just draw us to you, Father. Uh, we want to know you more. We want to love you more. We want to serve you well. So, Father, I just pray that you would uh, allow your Holy Spirit to speak through me. I will step aside and let your Spirit speak through me uh, to deliver the message that, that you would like to be heard, Father. I just thank you for these men and women who have set aside this time to uh, join in this study, those that will be joining in the days ahead, uh, listening to the, the uh, recording. Uh, Father, I pray you will bless their uh, families, uh, bless them with good health and safety and protection from evil. Father, they're your children, they're seeking you, and I know that honors your name, so bless them richly. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us. We thank Grace School of Theology for this platform to share this message around the world because of technology. Uh, we give you praise in it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I've been excited now to talk about each person of the Trinity. As we talked about the unity of the Trinity last week, uh, we will be looking at God the Father tonight. We'll be looking at Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, next week. Uh, and then we'll be getting to the Holy Spirit a couple of weeks later. Uh, and you'll understand why when we get to those, those uh, sessions. But in starting tonight, uh, as we talk about God the Father, we have to deal with the elephant that's in the room. And that would be an earthly father who perhaps failed you in a big way. For some, just the thought of God the Father sends chills up their spines. Sure, they say, I'll serve and I'll obey God the Father if that's expected. But to get to know and love such a God, mm. I don't think I can. Many believers, many unbelievers, suffer from an impaired relationship with God because they have an inaccurate perception of who God the Father is. Perhaps you have had images of a father who is like a divine law enforcement, always pointing out what you do wrong and dishing out punishment on a regular basis. Or maybe you imagine a father as a divine employer, always requiring perfection in exchange for minimal acknowledgement or payment. For some, your image of a father is like Santa Claus, providing gifts occasionally after you've proven that you are a good girl or good boy, but then disappearing from your life for most of the year, never there when you need him most. In none of these images do you see sacrificial, unconditional love. But oh, we get a different picture of Father God simply from looking at testimony in his word. We learn in Acts 17, 25 and Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 that he gives us life and an eternal home, an eternal home. Psalms 103, 13 and 14, God is compassionate. He is tender hearted. Matthew 6, 26 and 31 through 33, God is caring, nurturing, and meets every need. In Luke 15, 11 through 24, God offers unconditional love. He is forgiving. He is gracious. He is merciful. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, God is holy. He's righteous. He is just. And I love this. He is love. Galatians 4, 4. God is abundant in grace and mercy. Psalms 139, 7 through 12, God is always with us. Luke 6, 35, he rewards our efforts. Psalms 
Psalm 68, 5. God is the father of the orphans and defenders of the widows. That's a different picture than the, God, than the father images that perhaps you have had that were misguided. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 tells us that we are to take every thought captive. Instead of the preconceived images that you might have had about God the Father, let me give you a few biblical picture images that you can use to replace those false images that we started with tonight. First, I want us to look at God, our rock. 2 Samuel 22, 2 and 3 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. Now, I'd love to hear from you. If you, if you will speak up, what are some characteristics of a large boulder, a large rock, that you think might parallel with characteristics of God the Father. Any thoughts? You see? When we think of a big boulder, the, the one that came to my mind was Stone Mountain in Georgia. I don't know if you've ever been there. The thing is huge, yeah. huge. <laughs> but what are some Movable? characteristics of a rock? I'm sorry? Oh, a move, immovable? Good for you. Yes, absolutely. It cannot be moved. Immovable. Cannot Strong. be moved. Strong. Strong. Anyone else? Um, solid too. Oh, solid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Picturing a huge rock. A huge rock. <laughs> big. Not just big. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, so being large, he can hide us, can he? Mm. Can hide us to protect us. Mm -hmm. Hide us from an enemy, right? Because he's immovable, he's reliable. Mm. It's not like we're going to go back to see him at that rock tomorrow and it's gone. No, reliable. And I love this idea. That rock was there before us mm. and it's going to be there after us, isn't it? Oh, just like God the Father. So we've determined that he's immovable. Unless he wants to move, he ain't moving. <laughs> he's sure. He's reliable. We can hide with under him, under his, under his shelter for protection. He was before us. He will be here when we're gone. Now let's look at God, our warrior. Exodus 15, 3 and 4 says, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has thrown into the sea. Isaiah 42, 13 says, The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. I love that. It doesn't say he might. He will prevail against his enemies. So we know that a warrior is one who understands the art of war, one who has proven himself on the battlefield. His reputation is one of victory over his enemies. But what characteristics does a warrior have? Any thoughts about that? I think a warrior is prepared. I mean, he has everything at his disposal. Absolutely. <laughs> he is prepared, right? Because, yeah. yes, absolutely. He's sure. uh, well sure. trained. Oh, I'm sorry. Say yeah. again. Well trained. Well, well trained. Trained, <laughs> yeah. trained himself. Yeah. Himself. Yeah. Shows strength. Uh huh. Strength. Yes. Obedient. Yes. Mm. Obedient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the helpless. A defender of the helpless. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we're, we're saying he's strong. He's valiant. He's a protector of the defenseless. He's a defender. Oh, I love that picture of God the Father. And then a favorite of mine is God our shepherd. Mm. 
Now we all know uh, that of Jesus Christ as the great shepherd, right? Mm -hmm. But when you look at Psalms 23, written by David, this was before Christ. And so he would have been thanking God the Father. And so when you look at Psalms 23, we're all familiar with it. This particular translation that I've used here is is the um, New American Standard Version. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, we're going to stop at verse 4 right now in that passage because I want us to dig a little bit a little bit deeper. Uh, the Bible knowledge commentary is one that I use at home a lot, and I, I enjoy it provides really good insight on the psalmist David's understanding of of these words that he wrote. Because remember, he was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. David was a shepherd. So he knew about what he was talking about, right? But even in writing this, he recognized God the Father was his shepherd. And so this parallel was just easy for David to make. Uh, And there's just some beautiful insight here. So we can learn of four blessings that come from the shepherd leading the sheep. One is spiritual nourishment. Now, a shepherd is all about leading his sheep to find fresh green grass for feeding. So the Lord leads his people. Those who follow the Lord do not lack in spiritual nourishment. Why? Because we have his word. We have his word. And we have the Holy Spirit in us who teaches us and guides us through it to apply it to our lives. Second, the second blessing of the shepherd is the spiritual restoration that he provides. A shepherd leads his sheep to placid waters for rest and for cleansing. Now, this reminds me of 1 John 1, 9. God's promise of cleansing believers who fail. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So I think of that cleansing particularly as believers, we still need that daily cleansing uh, from our sins. And I don't know if you're like me, when I confess a sin, there is such peace in my heart. You know, there's sometimes there's those little things we hang on to, those those, uh, like, Lord, I'm just not ready to deal with that yet. But when we don't deal with it, what happens? You know, we can't sleep. It's always on our mind. (laughs) We get stressed about it. It might affect our relationships with others and our daily life. But once we confess it, okay, Lord, I agree with you in this area. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. He gives us such peace in that moment. And so I thought that really paralleled well with, with how a shepherd leads the sheep to cool, clear, placid water where they can clean and be refreshed and be at peace. Another blessing from the shepherd's leading is guidance on the right path. Now, the shepherd knows the best path to ensure that every single sheep will return home at the end of the day. He doesn't want to lose any of his sheep, number one, because he loves them. He loves each and every one. I guarantee that shepherd has named every sheep. He doesn't want to lose one. But also, because of his reputation as a shepherd, it wouldn't be a good thing to be known that that shepherd is not taking care of his sheep. He's losing them, and they're wandering around into others' fields. So his reputation is is at stake. Our Father God, he protects us for those reasons as well. He loves us so much. 
He doesn't want any of us not to go home with him. And his reputation is at stake as well. John said, excuse me, Jesus says in John 10, 28 through 30, and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. But what does he say next? My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. You know, my mind when I read that immediately goes back to the to the playground and you've got this child who's so proud of his dad and he's saying my dad is stronger and bigger than your dad and that other kid's known my dad's stronger <laughs> and, and, and I so I could just imagine gee, I hope this is it's not inappropriate but I could just imagine Jesus saying you know what Mr. Devil you cannot snatch my brothers and sisters out of my hand and you know what? My father, he's greater than all. And you can't snatch them out of his hand either. I love that. God's reputation is on the line. He will keep us. He will keep us. That is so comforting. And of course, then there is the blessing of protection. Sheep did not have to fear the valleys of deep darkness or the shadow of death because the shepherd is always equipped with a rod and a staff to protect them in, in those situations. If they fell off the cliff, off the, uh, uh, off the cleft of the rock, he could take his staff and help pull them back up. On one of our trips to Israel, we visited the wilderness of Judea. Many of you may have been there, seen it. It brought Psalms 23 to life for me. It was basically a gorge where there was a valley between hills with steep rocky walls, dark crevices. The valley was very, very deep, very, very dark in places. But in other places, it was bright with the sunshine coming in and plush green grass. Now, our guide commented that it was typical of the area where David would likely be a shepherd. So when we find ourselves in a deep, dark place, and we all do, don't we? I mean, it's just life. We do. We can be comforted to know that the Lord is right there with us. We are never in a situation that the Lord is not aware of because he is with us. Isn't that comforting? Mm -hmm. uh, I can just see David the shepherd sitting on the side of that, that rock, uh, pinning the words of Psalm 23 as he thought of these precious sheep that he loved, but oh, how much more the father loved him. He didn't have to worry about anything. Now let's go back to verse five. Verse five says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Certainly goodness and faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life. And my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord forever. Now here the scene changes to that of a banquet hall where the gracious host is providing a lavish hospitality, a huge spread of food. David rejoiced in the provision and particularly because it was in the presence of his enemies. Now listen to this, folks. The enemy cannot steal the provision that Father God has planned for you. He owns it all. He's king of kings. And he makes provision for his kids. For his family 
And the enemy cannot take away what God has planned for you. And we can be confident that he will meet our every need. Now, that doesn't mean he meets our every want, our every desire, because sadly, we've been so influenced by the world, we think we need a lot more than we actually need. But God will not allow the enemy to take what he knows that you need and what he has already prepared for you to have. The image of the anointing oil is commonly understood in David's day. When guests would come to visit, a gracious host would always welcome them with refreshing oil. The climate there is extremely dry and the oil was refreshing to their, to their skin. David knew in light of the provisions that God had made, that his lot in life, or his cup, as he refers to it, overflowed with abundant blessing. He realized that the Lord's love would go with him everywhere through all of his life. And so it is with us. He's a good, good father. Now, perhaps you're not convinced Hard questions may linger in your mind when you think about Father God. Where was he when I was abused? Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. He was there. He saw it all. But hear this. He received the abuse with you. You might recall Paul's conversion experience. You remember his name was Saul before he was converted to Paul. Saul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. Many of them would be killed. Acts 9 tells us that a light shone from heaven and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now you would think if, if it weren't the case that Christ would say, you're persecuting my children or you're persecuting believers, you're persecuting my brothers and sisters. No, you're persecuting me. And then what about Matthew 25, where Christ makes reference to those who feed the hungry and clothe the naked and visit the sick and those in prison. And he said, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. He then makes the opposite contrast of not caring for the hungry, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned. Again, he says, as you did not do for the least of these, you did not do to me. So the Lord receives our action towards others, good or bad, and he sees the intent of the heart. He always looks at the heart. So he sees the heart of the perpetrator, and he is being abused right along with you. So the question then would be, well, then why or doesn't he care? I mean, if he saw it, didn't he care? Oh, yes, he cared. Zechariah 2.18 says, He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Psalm 56.8 says, You have kept count of my tossings. You have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not written in your book? David understood that God cares so deeply that he sees every tear, that he writes down your tossings, and your tears. First Peter 5, 7, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Oh, he cares for you. Well, then you ask, well, then how could a loving God allow this to happen? You know, because we are made in the image of God, 
we possess the capacity to make moral decisions. But in contrast with God, who cannot sin, we can reject his will and we can violate his commands. You see, God did not want us to be robots. He wanted mankind to love him just as he loves them. Out of their heart's desire, not because they were forced to do so. We should all be able to relate to that. We don't want someone to be forced to love us, do we? That wouldn't be love. So as a result of Satan's influence, the first couple, Adam and Eve, chose evil instead of good. They desired to be their own God. Their decision brought terrible tragedy on all humanity. Life on this earth has never been the same, not since the days of innocence in the Garden of Eden. Virtually all of the natural and moral evil experienced by humanity comes as a result of what is called the fall of man. Because of the fall, people get cancer and other diseases. Children are abused, victimized. There are all sorts of addictions that cause harm to self and to others. There are horrific natural disasters and wars. Because of the fall, bad things happen to good people. So the question then is, well, isn't God powerful enough to do something about this evil? Think back to the characteristics of God that we talked about last week, the Trinity. Our all-knowing, all-wise, everywhere present, all-powerful God has always had a plan versus the curse to restore all things and to redeem mankind. Now we can trace that plan from Genesis to Revelation. We learn that God will restore his kingdom authority and deal justly with sin. Now God had entrusted his world that he made good to mankind, but the deceiver Satan took it away and he now rules the unregenerated, unbelieving world, but it's only temporary. Because of God's grace and his sacrificial love, he chose to provide a way of deliverance from our fate of spiritual death, from the penalty and the power of sin that's all over our lives, and to provide a way to restore the intimate fellowship that was lost. God's loving goal is to have us with him now and forever to bring praise and glory to his name. And he presented and made possible that accomplishment through his son, Jesus Christ, and Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection, and his ultimate return to earth. Now we're going to talk more next session about this amazing demonstration of love when we talk about who is God the Son. But there's another question that might be on your mind, and it's, will God heal me from my brokenness? Absolutely he will. Cry out to Father God. Psalms 34, 17 and 18 says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Because God is not bound by time, he knew that your abuse would take place. So in his power and in his wisdom, he determined beforehand how something that man intended for evil could be used for good in your life. As a victim of childhood sexual abuse, I can look back and I can see how God used my abuse to make me aware 
of the abuse of other people. He has given me a level of compassion that I know I would not have had before. Compassion that prompts me to come alongside those who have suffered as I did. He has given me opportunity to be a voice for the abused. To see that other people are made aware of the abuse, open their eyes and hearts to the abused. I have known childhood abuse victims who have written music, who have written books, who have written poetry, all for the purpose of ministering to others who were abused. I've known others who have earned degrees in counseling to bring professional help to victims. I know still others who have helped in providing safe houses so victims might escape dangerous environments. I have a friend who started a ministry in San Antonio. She herself was an abuse victim and as an adult, uh, realizing the long-term suffering that results from that, has started a, a ministry, an outreach to others who have been abused, uh, uh, a counseling group and support group and encouragement group. Your ministry is found where you've been broken. Your testimony is found where you've been restored. Bottom line, your ministry to others will bring healing to you. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort that which we ourselves are comforted by God. I want to close with this uh, one more image of Father God, and that is Abba Father. Abba Father. In the book, Understanding Christian Theology, we get a bit of insight on the term Abba. The Aramaic Abba stems from what we might call baby talk. According to the Jewish Talmud, and, and the Talmud is a comprehensive 2,700 plus page <laughs> book of Jewish laws and uh, Jewish oral laws, I should say. And it's considered a practical guide for daily living according to Jewish law. So in the Talmud, when a child is weaned, the child learns to say Abba, which means daddy. And by the way, Ima means mama. Mm -hmm. Over time, the word used evolved to include adult sons and daughters. They would use those terms of endearment for their parents. Now, the term Abba is not used in the Old Testament. We see in Romans 8.16 in the New Testament, where the Holy Spirit invites believers to cry, what? Abba, Father. Isn't that beautiful? This is a level of intimacy that we receive because we have faith in Jesus Christ. And it's a shared intimacy with Christ. Because do you recall when Christ was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed, Abba, Father. In other words, he said, Daddy, the most intimate term that he could use for God the Father. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. You know, in my darkest moments, I would imagine myself entering the throne room of God, regardless of the hour, because see, we, we can approach him anytime. 
running into his arms and crying, Abba, Daddy. But in response, I would imagine our Father God drawing me close, putting his arms around me and saying, this is my daughter, my trophy of mercy and grace. Of course, that's an imagined visual, but it's based on biblical truth. And God uses that visual to comfort me and to heal my wounded heart. I love Christian music. Prior to tonight, Tammy and I were talking about songs that were on our playlist that we listen to when we walk. Um, there's something just very endearing about music that truly praises our Lord. And I love the old hymns, but I also love uh, the new praise music as well. I just love music. But there's a song called The Goodness of God, and I know you've heard it. It's by Bethel Music. But it has so encouraged my heart to dwell on his goodness. To dwell on his goodness. A portion of the lyrics read, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Well, I just pray that tonight your vision of Father God has changed a bit to draw you closer to him, to draw you to his throne room. Because I can tell you anytime you go, your Abba Father is waiting for you with open arms. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, oh, we love you. And Father, we uh, just want to be in your presence. And it thrills my soul to know that you want to be in ours. Father, I just uh, think of the many who do have a misunderstanding of your character, who do have an image that's just not true. Oh, Father, help us to be a voice for you. Help us to uh, help restore your reputation in this world of who you really are. To be able to share your love with people who do not know you, Father. And Lord, for those who do know you, that there would be a um, just a falling in love with you all over again. So Father, I pray that these uh, scriptures and passages would be ones that we could return to again and again and to be encouraged, uh, to be confident in who our God is. And Father God, I am just so grateful for your role in the Trinity and for allowing us, Father, to be part of your story and part of your eternity. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Well, I would love to uh, get your thoughts or additions, comments, questions. Feel free to open, uh, open the lines and, and talk with us. That was good, Carmen. I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, kind of dwell a little bit on, on God healing from brokenness. And um, there's, uh, there's a great podcast series on saving grace from Mark Ray. He says strong, it's entitled Strong but Broken Places. And yes. I would encourage yes. everybody to listen to that because that ministered to me tremendously um, about two years ago when I was listening to that. And it's- Oh, uh, absolutely. Yes, that is excellent. Uh, Mark Ray is- uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, the can, you repeat that again? can you repeat that podcast again? 
Yeah, it is. It is on the Saving Grace podcast, which is available from the Grace Grace Center. Uh, but um, the title is "Strong at the Broken Places," and it's actually a series of uh, I think maybe four episodes. Yes. Uh, that Mark Ray did, and and I think the thing that really spoke to me is that when he heals us from our brokenness, he doesn't hide the brokenness, but instead he uses that so much. And and you mentioned that in terms of your own your own uh, abuse and how that has helped you. Yes, you know, and I think yes, yes. My, my going through through cancer and some other health issues and how I've been able to use that to minister to others in a way that uh, I wouldn't have otherwise. Mm, that's exactly right. Uh, you think about things that you go through in life, and when you look to someone to help you, don't you go to someone who's been there, mm -hmm. someone who's been through it. I, I can't think how many times, Tim, you've encouraged my heart in my walk with leukemia. Just encouraged my heart, and I knew because you'd been there. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and with no matter what the issue is, uh, whether it's finances or marriage issues, whatever it is, we're going to go to people who have been there and been through what we've been through. Uh, but God is, is so good to not only make us, uh, to heal us, but to make us better. Make us better than we were before. Uh, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, there truly is beauty in the healed. And uh, so uh, his purposes are always good. Yeah, he is a, a loving, good, good God. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Yes, Carmen. I've lived with uh, chronic depression for over 30 years. And as I share what God has taught me through that and how he has redeemed many of those tears, as you recorded earlier, I remember that psalm in particular that spoke to my heart about him holding our tears in his bottle. God has used that to really minister to a lot of people. I often, uh, and I had that experience this week when I had shared in a prayer group a couple weeks ago about my history with depression and a woman whose daughter-in-law is in the hospital right now and she called me and just wanted to share some things with me and I got an opportunity to pray with her and it was such a beautiful time and, and after we got off the phone, I said, Lord, you know, I can thank you <laughs> for all those terrible times when I was suffering so deeply in the pit of despair and, and hopelessness. And, and so I have such empathy for people who go through that. And yes, he does use that. And when you said about um, our ministry is found where you are broken and your testimony yeah. is found where you were healed, that really just spoke to my mm -hmm. heart that God has, mm -hmm. he, he was right there with me in the midst of all that. And he is using it now for his glory. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, he doesn't waste anything. Mm -hmm. He doesn't waste anything. He goes way back into our life. He takes every little thing that shaped us, that formed us, that, and, and ever so often he'll pull something out and go, okay, here's a person that you need to talk to. I know you've had that nudge on your shoulder, right? And here's somebody that needs you to pray with them. Uh, I love it when he does that. And I mm -hmm. always know that it's going to be someone that, is going through something that I've been through, good or bad, and and uh, so yeah, it's great. And I appreciate that, Dottie. And I, I'm just I can just see the joy in your your heart when you speak now. So he's obviously done a healing work in your life, oh, yeah. and I praise yeah. I praise him for that, Dottie. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a word to share before we close? Let you go. I think this is such a good reminder of God. It, we, Terry and I have been studying Ezekiel, and it's like, oh, my goodness, the the way they were, uh, God had to judge the nations, Israel, Egypt, all the Tyre side, and, and this brings us back to, especially in Psalm 23, thinking God is good, or he's Abba, Father, he's a daddy. You know, sometimes we separate God's the Old Testament, Jesus is the New Testament full of love, and God is, is the judge, but this takes all that away, and it's like, oh yeah, God is, God is good, God is kind, he's 
sweet, he's wonderful, you know, instead of like thinking he's ready to judge. But anyway, thank you. That was really, really helpful. And of course, we, we do know that he also is just and, and a mm -hmm. God of wrath. Mm -hmm. right. But he made a way that we would not have to suffer that wrath, and that's through Jesus Christ. So again, it goes back. He's a, he's a good, good God. He certainly is. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, look forward to our time together next week as we talk about who is the sun. And uh, we just got so much more good stuff to share. So uh, I hope you'll join me. And uh, if not live, uh, catch it later. But it's just a pleasure to have all of you uh, with me tonight. And um, I really appreciate each and every one. And I'm keeping you all in my prayers. Uh, I know the enemy does not like us to have Bible studies. So I'm sure there's always hindrances and things that can't be avoided. Uh, but then we want to pray against those that the enemy tries to, to put out in front of you. So, so take care, have a safe week, uh, and hopefully we'll get to see you next week. God bless everyone.